And I know this because my friend Matt actually memorized the Sermon on the Mount, which I thought was pretty crazy. He, he memorized it. And at one crew meeting, we had him share the whole Sermon on the Mount. And it took him about 18 minutes to go through the whole thing. So this is Jesus. So that's, that's also it shows that it's okay to give a shorter message every once in a while, right? Like if Jesus can give maybe the most famous sermon of all time in under 20 minutes, it's okay to go short. But so that's one of the unique parts. The other thing is it's not like a typical sermon where, you know, we hear, we have this one passage and then we talk about it for 40 minutes. It's just Jesus. He's talking about all these different ideas, right? Jesus hits on money. He hits on prayer. He hits on fasting. He hits on loving your enemies, all these different things. And he does it in under 20 minutes. It's incredible. And he also does it where it feels like a unified sermon somehow, right? He's just, Jesus is a master communicator, right? Which makes sense. He's God, right? He can be great at a lot of things, but he's a great communicator. He's able to share this message in such a profound way. And as you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you see these, these different themes play out throughout the whole thing. One that Devin is going to kick off next week. She's going to do an amazing job as she goes through the Beatitudes. But he talks about how his kingdom, how his way of following him is just counter how we think the world should work a lot of the times. It's just upside down in a lot of ways. And so he talks like that, how he starts to say like, hey, following me, living under my rule looks different. And he continues on that idea of like, hey, following me looks different than what you think. And then he goes on to say how it looks different even in how you interact with each other, right? It, it's interact with loving one another, right? Loving your enemies, right? We don't think that's a, a normal thing to do. And he even talks about how his kingdom is different than what the religious leaders of the day were teaching. He goes through this whole section where he says, you've heard it said, but I say, right? He's like, this is what they're teaching you but here's what I tell you. And so Jesus does that. And then he goes in to talk about how religious practice of the day had kind of been warped, right? He talks about giving. He talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. Then he talks about how relationships should look different, not even our relationships with each other, but our relationships with money and possessions. And finally he ends talking about what it looks like to be a true disciple. And that's where we land on what we're going to look at tonight as he kind of wraps up the Sermon on the Mount. And so if you have your Bible, you can go to Matthew 7, starting in verse 24. And Jesus says this. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on the bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And that's how he ends. And listen to what the crowd says, because he's teaching this to a crowd of people. And they, it says, when, the crowd, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike they're teachers of religious law. So Jesus ends, and as the crowd listens, they're amazed at what he had just said. And so as, we, as I look at that last passage, there's a few things that I want to look at specifically. One is that Jesus asserts his authority in that last passage. Jesus asserts his authority. Look at what he says. He says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows them is wise. Right, so when I'm giving you this message tonight, I'm not gonna say anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, right? I'm not that authority. My whole goal tonight is to point you to the scriptures, which is the ultimate authority, right? That's what any good Bible teacher does. They point back to the Bible. They don't teach on their authority. They teach on the authority of God's word. Jesus does it different, right? He says, you follow my word. You follow what I say. We don't get as tripped up by that. We're used to Jesus talking like that. But imagine you're his audience. And all of a sudden, here's this guy coming around and making his words at the same level as the word of God. 
right? He does it throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount. I said earlier, he uses phrases like, you've heard it said about a passage, but I say this. You've heard it said, don't murder, but I say, don't think angry thoughts about someone in your heart. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Well, I say, don't have lustful thoughts about someone, right? He just, he is saying, here is what I say, and it is truth, right? This is why Jesus says things like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. He asserts authority, and the audience got it. They were amazed at the authority that he taught with. And as we think of this idea as of building a foundation, because that's where this goes to, the only way you're going to build your foundation on the words of Jesus if you, is if you trust he's the ultimate authority. Because if you don't trust that, you pick and choose. You pick and choose what you already agree with. Whatever your current worldview likes, you like that part of Jesus. But when he's the ultimate authority, you don't get to pick and choose. What he says goes. And that's how he teaches. If you, as you read through the Sermon on the Mount, as we look at it, this is, this is a high bar that Jesus sets in this sermon. This is not watered down at all. And he's saying, giving this thing to, to his followers, that this is how you're supposed to live. Wise people will obey, will follow, will put into practice what I'm teaching. So the first thing, he asserts his authority, right? And then he goes on and he says that we move beyond just believing something's true to actually putting into practice. He calls us beyond simply believing something. He calls us beyond a set of facts that we agree with to actually putting that into practice. And I think this is incredibly important. Often following Jesus or even starting to follow him is like answering the right answers to a quiz. Do you believe this, this, and this? Well, you're good to go. But Jesus doesn't really say that here. And if you follow this whole sermon, Jesus is calling people to live a way that is very different. I've heard pastors and theologians call this like Jesus's manifesto of how to live in his kingdom. This is how he's calling you to live your life. But he says, when you do that, when you actually put my teachings into practice, it's building a solid foundation. So my dad and I didn't take a lot of trips together growing up, but we did go camping one time. And I say one time, because I think after this one camping trip, we decided we'd never do it again. So we decided we'd go to this lake with some friends and they had an RV and we had a really cheap tent with like pegs that went into the ground that were like this deep. And that night happened to be one of those typical summer storms in Wisconsin, where it was humid all day and every, at one point it just broke. And it was windy and out by the middle of the night, I'm not kidding you, my dad and I are in the middle of the tent and all of the legs are off the ground and everything is blowing around. The only place that's on the ground is where the 300 pounds of my dad and me are huddled in the center. And so at one point we decide we got to get out of here, right? So we leave and we go over to the RV and ask our friends if we can sleep over there, which we should have done from the beginning. There were two of them and like four beds but I guess we decided to be rustic, right? But really the reality is this is, it's kind of a picture of what Jesus was describing of the people who don't put into practice, who don't put things into practice and have a firm foundation, right? It's in sand, that's what our tent was in. It was this deep in sand. And so we just literally by the next morning, our tent had blown away and broken. It was, part of it was up in a tree and we never used that tent again. But when we went into the RV, everything was fine right? It was actually really nice. You know, you could hear the storm. It wasn't, wasn't like a house, but it, was, it wasn't shaking like our tent was. And so what Jesus is saying is that, like, if you simply just hear what I say, but don't put it into practice, you're going to be like that tent. You're going to blow all over the place. But following me is actually obeying me and putting into practice what I teach. There's more to it than just hearing. There's actually doing. Theologians use the phrase orthodoxy and orthopraxy. They're big words, and I'm going to use them so you think I'm smart. But really, was what they mean is right action and right like beliefs. So orthodoxy is right beliefs. 
Orthopraxy is right action. And what Jesus says is we need both. But often today, we're just focused on right belief or right action. We don't have them together. We have one or the other, but Jesus is very clear we need both of them, orthodoxy, ortho orthopraxy. He says it here. This, this last spring, we put a new bedroom and bathroom in our basement, and the price tag was a little higher than we could afford if we had them do all the work, so I had to do some of it, which included like digging out the plumbing, the trench for the plumbing, and then I had to put concrete back in over it. And the concrete was simple. It was just a mix where you mix the concrete mixture and water. But the concrete mixture by itself did nothing. It was just dust. But when you added water, it became a substance that would then become solid and firm. And really that to me is what orthodoxy and orthopraxy are. Orthodoxy without orthopraxy is the concrete mixture without water. Right beliefs without right action don't really do anything. Orthopraxy without orthodoxy is like water. It doesn't do the right thing. If I just poured water in there to try to make a foundation, that's not going to go very well either. But when they go together, they do what they were supposed to do. And so when we combine the right belief of who God is and what he's called us to do with the right action of living that out, that's ultimately what Jesus has called us to. And that's how the foundation gets built. That's what Jesus calls us to. He calls us beyond just belief, but into action, a faith that goes forward to put our faith into practice. And ultimately, as you look at the text, that's the kind of faith that's able to withstand the storms, the rains, all of the wind that's going to hit you. Right? Because I don't know about you, but 2020 and the beginning of 2021 has felt like one constant storm. One constant storm of things hitting me over and over and over, right? You start with COVID and you kind of think we got that under control. You have just racial unrest in our country. Then you have COVID back again for take two. You have an election that's about as contentious, not about as, as contentious as I've ever seen. And then you get COVID round three and in that we got COVID, which was super fun. And then our kids got, we're back at home all the time. That was different too. And all this kind of stuff and people we knew got sick from COVID and passed away. And it was just a hard year and we turned the corner and guess what? It didn't get a lot better. And so here's the reality, right? If, if last year you went in with kind of your house built on sand, it was an incredibly hard year to walk with Jesus. It was already a hard year. I would say it was almost impossible if your foundation was built on sand. But that's what Jesus says will happen. Never in the Bible does Jesus say, there won't be wind, there won't be storms. Anyone who promises you that, like following Jesus is going to be easy. They're just lying. There's no point in scripture that tells you that. It is going to be hard. There's going to be storms, but Jesus tells you to withstand that storm, you build the right foundation. You put your foundation in him. Right? And as we do that, those storms don't hit us quite the same way. We're able to experience a year like we just had and not say, wow, that was simple. Let's say God was still good in the midst of it. And you still grew in the midst of it right? It's one of the things I tell people often with college is I'll hear parents say things like, man, I just hope my kid makes it through those four years still believing in Jesus. And I'm like, if that's your best bet, their foundation isn't very deep. College is going to be hard, but so is the rest of your life. There's going to be people telling you that what you believe isn't true and all this stuff. But if your foundation is deep, you can grow a ton when you're a college student. It's all about your foundation. And Jesus says that comes from hearing and putting into practice. But it's not just hardships and trials that want to shake our foundation, right? It can be false teachings that can shake our foundation. We can believe kind of things about Jesus, but have false teachings that work its way in, right? Often we've heard, if, you, if you've been around the church, this idea of the prosperity gospel, which promises you that things are going to be easy or that you'll have wealth or health. But inevitably, you could still get sick when you follow Jesus. You still get COVID. You might not get the job that you wanted. 
So if, you're, if your foundation is in the wrong place, then it will be a struggle. And I've seen it this past year with false, false teaching that's crept into churches that I've gone to as I look at my social media feed and see Christian friends of mine. I see things like conspiracy theories becoming common and accepted. I don't know how much you know about QAnon, but I've seen it all throughout some of my Facebook friends. And it's a false teaching that takes some idea of little pieces of Christianity, but puts it on this conspiracy theory and people have bought in. And if your foundation isn't in the rock, isn't in that solid foundation, you will start to believe these things easier and easier. You'll believe these things that aren't true, that are misrepresenting the truth of the gospel, the truth of Christianity, and you'll be led astray. But when your foundation is deep, you can test those things, discern those things, and say, no, this is not how Christianity is supposed to look. This is not what it means to follow Jesus. And then the other thing that, the other storms that come are just different idols and things that we have in our lives, comforts that we want. So for a lot of us, the idol is approval of others. I don't actually struggle with wanting others to like me. I just want others to think I'm really smart. So that's my thing. I'm telling you my sin right now. But the reality how that plays out then is if I'm not rooted and founded in the truth of who Jesus is and living that out, I can be easily swayed by what is going to make people think I'm smart or respect me more. And so when I first became a Christian, this was a battle right off the bat because some of my family thought I was in a cult. Like, not kidding. Like, that's really what they thought about me. And as someone who likes to be thought of as smart, you don't think smart people in cult, right? Those aren't two things that go together very often. But I was able to sit there and think, you know what, as I, I know what I believe, and as I live this out, this is not what a cult is, right? Like, I'm living out this truth of who Jesus is with people who love him and who are benefiting the greater campus that I was on, the city that I was in. And I, as I saw Christianity lived out, I saw a beautiful expression. And I was like, that's not what this is. And so even though they thought that about me, I was able to have a foundation and it didn't sway me. But that's continued, right? I've been called a lot of different things following Jesus, and you probably will too. As I've embraced the, the historic biblical sexual ethic, I've been called a bigot at times. And that's not fun. That's not a title I want to claim, but I know it's not true. And in the past year, as I've embraced God's heart for racial and ethnic justice, I've been called a socialist and a Marxist. And if my identity is in how those people perceive me, I'm going to back off from that. But instead, I know that that's what God's calling me into. I see it all throughout scripture, and so I'm going to go forward. I'm going to put it into practice. And as I live it out, I, I can see, as I live it out in community, I can see the truth, the beauty of this. And so that's what I love about this reality of putting our faith into practice, especially as you do it in community. Because community can keep you from going off the rails too. And so as you live this out, you start to see the beauty of what Jesus has called us into. And as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to hear things that are hard. Like when Jesus says, be perfect as, the heavenly, as your heavenly father is perfect, right? Not a low bar. Or when Jesus says, not one iota, not one dot of the Old Testament law will fall away. You don't get to pick and choose what you like. It's not a low bar, but it is the best bar that you can have. It is so good. As we look at the Beatitudes next week, imagine a people who embrace that life. As we hear the call to love your enemy, imagine what it looks like if we actually did that. If you, as you see a, a faith lived out that's not hypocritical, but it's about being in the presence of God, imagine what it is if that's lived out, or not worrying about all the different things, but just being trusting in who God is. Imagine what it looks like if that's lived out. That's the Sermon on the Mount. That's what we're going to spend the next seven weeks looking at. Really this idea of what does it look like if we put our faith into practice.
And so each week we're gonna try to give like little things that you can, uh, steps you can take, little our spiritual practices that might help. And so this week, and we're gonna try to post them on social media on Friday, not tonight, cause there's already so much going on, but on Friday. And so this week we're gonna have what's called the rule of life. A rule of life is simply a way to live, to prioritize, to have patterns and rhythms to help put your faith into practice, to help grow in specific areas. And so tomorrow you'll see on our social media, probably an article and probably a sermon that you can listen to on what it looks like to develop a rule of life. Or you can talk to a crew staff. We'd love to help you work through that. But we really do desire that we would be people who put our faith into practice. That's my hope. That's my goal. That's our desire throughout this series is that we would be people who put our faith into practice. So let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for this message. I'm excited for these next seven weeks as we look at this text and so much truth from you. Um, yeah, we ask that we would become people who are rooted and grounded, whose foundation is in the rock, which is you. That we would live this out, that we would be salt and light to the campus, to the city, to the world, as we follow you in the way that you call us to live. Amen.